Hey there, Dave Pilatus, Can I Missing Project? Got Reddit edition for our video channel. And uh, still find my way back. I feel way better. <coughs> I'm coughing way less. So, I'm good. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a good segment with uh, three missing people, two missing cases, and uh, very strange circumstances. First, get into some letters, some current events. First thing, Supreme Court ruling just the other day talked about uh, two big decisions. One is our government can't use OSHA to enforce the vaccine on employers of 100 or more. That was the first decision. But now, I like to use this the health professionals in the United States are now the only working professionals in the United States that can't make decisions about the vaccine. <coughs> if, if the medical professionals out there stand up, we could have far less, unfortunately, health professionals in the hospitals in the very near future. Big thing coming up is the U.S. is attending the Olympics in China. This is this is an interesting discussion that I've had with some friends and family just recently. Saying, Dave, if your kids were of age, would you encourage them to go to China and compete? Boy. It's a tough one. Here's why. I really truly understand an athlete's mindset. They work their whole life to get in a position during those during the Olympic Games to be at your peak performance in your whole life. That's all you work towards is a gold medal. And then they get in the position and we find out that the uh, world Olympic body has given the Olympics this winter to China. An amazing decision considering China's history of human rights. Something we usually don't do. We usually don't reward countries that are violating human rights left and right and have camps that hold people that haven't committed a crime. But that's what China's done. Now we have had diplomats and people working for our government around the world that have come home <clears throat> with something that's called Havana Syndrome. They're attacked with some type of electronic device, they think, that causes them extreme medical issues, equilibrium issues, etc. It's happened in many places around the world and right now they haven't figured it out. A lot of thoughts and ideas and I've read them all but yeah and I hope somebody who's really smart sits down with our athletes and explains to them that they're going to be monitored 24 7 every place they go it's probably a hundred percent guarantee that their rooms will be bugged their electronic devices will be followed and listened to <coughs> And they will, especially the U.S., will be screened like there's no tomorrow. Don't take any illicit drugs or narcotics. Don't wander off from the Olympic Village. Stay with people and be very careful. Now, my concern also is that not only the safety of our athletes. But what about the, the gamesmanship at the Olympics? Is it even going to be fair? Are the Chinese athletes going to be tested at the same level that US athletes are tested? The general fairness of the games is something that has just been incremental in the success of the Olympics. So the question, would I encourage my kids to go? I probably wouldn't say anything. I'd leave, up, leave it up to them. I think it's a decision that each athlete has to undertake. 
but knowing it's their entire world to them, it's hard for me to see many of them not going. Now personally, I'm not an athlete, but the position I'm in in life, there's no way I'd go. Not a chance. Just because I wouldn't want to bring any highlight or good sense of well-being to the CCP. All this is is a giant propaganda campaign, campaign for the Chinese Communist Party. And the CHICOM want the world to see them as this glorious place. And folks, you will not see anything of the dark side of China on any of the propaganda on any of these channels. So that's China. A lot of you have said, Dave, why don't you maintain two channels? You know, a channel for missing people and a channel for missing people on YouTube and a channel for something else at another location. I said this before and maybe people aren't listening or maybe they're not watching the videos. I hit, the choice of me to stay has been made by them, not me. I got a strike for doing nothing. They never would explain what I did. So how could I avoid ever doing it again? Think about it. And they can deplatform me for no reason at any time. They've done this to many people, many organizations. It's not a choice. I could be here one day and they could say, forget the three strikes, he's gone, and I'm gone. So only a fool stays under these circumstances. And then I want you to think about this logic. I've made this company thousands and thousands of dollars. Why would I want to continue to put money into their pocket so that they can take those profits and use it as propaganda on other platforms to try to sway you and to continue to violate your First Amendment rights? That's right. So tell me why I want to stay. <clears throat> So, because we're in this process of leaving YouTube and looking for the right platform to go to, trying to understand the numbers and the data that we get off of YouTube, one thing that they don't tell you, but one thing I did figure out, is 80% of the comments on my videos are made by people that are unsubscribed. It's a cumbersome thing to figure out, but you can do it. And I spent many hours the other day trying to understand this correlation between the numbers. The reason being is that the 333,000 that are listed as subscribers, that number is probably close to a million, just based on the contents of the response on the videos. <coughs> if you take that and you extrapolate that as to how many people will leave and go with me for a small subscriber fee, it's substantial. So I'm pretty comfortable in saying, you know, we're going, not looking back. Some people question, hey Dave, why not just continue to use Google for your searches? Google uses your searches against you. Let's say that uh, they, they see you're Googling one political aspect of the world. On your searches, they're going to put something else in front of you, maybe tomorrow or the next day, that's going to try to influence your thinking. You may say, oh, that's crazy. No, that's true. <laughs> they have such advanced search, understand, and deploy techniques, it would boggle your mind. That's why I, I went to just duck, duck, go duck, duck, go, uh, to use for all my searches. They don't track searches. They don't do anything like Google does. Believe me, stay away. So, first letter. Dave, I spent the last 23 years as a middle school teacher in the eastern part of the country. I'm a graduate 
uh, in Georgia and have worked as a federal correctional officer and in private sector security for several years before starting my career in education. I'm a lover of the outdoors, nature, or national parks in our beautiful country. As a 52-year-old law-abiding citizen of the state of Delaware and habitual follower of your research for many years, I'm growing quite concerned about the direction I see going in state and local government, the media, and in society. I support your views on several different issues and feel that there is a concerted effort to push your message under the umbrella of what is considered by many to be misguided rantings of a conspiracy theorist. Please don't let it happen. There are many educated colleagues of mine who know of you and respect the position you take on thinking critically about topics covered in your videos. I know that I can speak for them in saying that we hope that you will not be deterred by the naysayers who hide behind the rocks only to emerge and attack those who are threatened to enrage and engage in a positive point of view. God bless you, your son and your family, and the effort you bring in extending yourself. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> that person's from Delaware, which brought up something else I read this week. You know that uh, our administration is flying the uh, illegal aliens into different locations across the United States, including Florida and Pennsylvania. And there's a legislator in Pennsylvania who's pushing forth a bill to put all of those illegal aliens on a bus at state expense and ship them to Delaware, where our president lives. You know who else is doing this? Governor DeSantis from Florida, because he had a huge influx of aliens flown in by the administration. He's putting them on buses and he's going to drive them to Georgia. I think it's apropos. I feel sorry for my supporters that are there, but I think they, should, they shouldn't drive them to Delaware. They should drive them to the front porch of Biden's house in my humble. That's one of the few times you're going to hear my humble opinion on it. <coughs> Another email. Every year, people resolve to do things that are better for their health. Quitting alcohol, processed foods, toxic relationships. I've come to the realization that my relationship with YouTube is dysfunctional. Sure, I can get millions of views, but why should I an allow anonymous fact checkers to censor my fully sourced fact-based content? Make sense? They don't want to challenge or debate me with opposing views. They just want me silenced. Did I write that? Last week I announced that I will begin an exodus from big tech beginning with YouTube because frankly they're the worst censors of all. I will no longer post videos on YouTube unless it is to criticize them or announce the, that viewers can see my content. Signed, Senator Rand Paul. Hmm, that's pretty good company. It's <laughs> first two paragraphs I could have wrote. Next letter. First, let me thank you for encouraging and educating people on critical thinking skills. This is much needed, especially now. I imagine you're familiar with the Theodore Roosevelt's man in the arena quote. Dave, you are the man in the arena. It's easy for people to sit on the outside of a ring and criticize. Don't let them steal your energy. Negativity is a tactic used to wear people down and lead them away from their destiny. You're doing the work that you are called to do. Keep up the good work and true work. You have many gifts to share with the world. Continue to express them. I'd also like to thank you for being a voice of mental health, introducing many people to NAMI. My condolences are with you regarding your Ben's death. You have taken the tragedy of Ben's loss and turned it into an opportunity for healing for thousands of people. Ben's legacy and his kind, gentle nature live on through your work. I am absolutely certain that your willingness to be authentic and share has helped many. I know from this personal experience I've worked in patient behavioral health for 10 years and as an art therapist and counselor. I love working with my clients and patients. I would still be there had I not lost my job due to the mandates. In addition to working inpatient, I've worked with women rebuilding their lives after being trafficked. Forced fraud, coercion, or tools of deception used in trafficking 
These tools of deception are also used in other areas, such as unconstitutional mandates and propaganda. I refuse to comply with them in the lie. Life requires necessary sacrifices. Losing my career was a huge sacrifice, which was not an easy decision. I am not alone in this. Many stepped up to the plate and paid the price. Life is a faith walk, and I'm trusting God in this adventure. Amen. There's an article, January 10th, 2022, in a site called govexec.com. It's called the Government Executive Magazine. <clears throat> the title of it is Common Office Desk Phone Could Be Leaking Info to Chinese Government, Report Alleges. Phones by Yealink, that's Y-E-A-L-I-N-K, have been observed sending encrypted messages to Chinese servers three times a day. A major Chinese phone maker could be putting U.S. consumers, companies, and even national security data at risk. And the U.S. Senator wants to know what the Commerce Department is going to do about it. In a September 28th letter obtained by Defense One, Senator Chris Van Hollen, a Democrat from Maryland, described a report that raises serious concerns about the security of audiovisual equipment produced and sold into the U.S. by this Chinese firm named Yealink. I bring this to you for one big reason. I've said this many times. Why don't we have a huge push for made in America and purchasing only made in America? I wish we would. And you know what? I'm going to talk about it here as much as I can. For that main reason that Chinese phone concerned by the senator. I don't know if it's true, but if a senator said it and wants the Commerce Department to look into it, he must, he must know something we don't, right? So why put yourself in a position of uh, allowing a spy ring to spy on your communications? Heck, you already do by your own NSA and our, and our own Apple and Gmail phones, etc. But it concerns me. And I have recently paid special attention going into stores, seeing where things, small electronic things I'm buying are, are made. And I got to say that almost 80% of the products I last looked at in uh, our big department stores, and three of them, all of them were made in China, 80%. And until we start complaining and stop buying those products, they'll continue to be made there. There's other options, maybe a little more time consuming for these companies, but they could go to many other countries where it's very inexpensive to manufacture. And that's a fact. Next email. Dave, I grew up in Southern California about an hour northeast of the beach at the base of the mountains below Big Bear and next to the Cajon Pass at the base of Lytle Creek. We were told that there were weird things happening in the mountains, so being stupid teenager, teenagers off we went. There were five or six of us that went up there every weekend for about two months. It gave us something to do and none of us drank or did any drugs. One evening it was a little foggy and chilly, typical Southern Cal night when the fog rolls in, with the trees and the small bushes more like shrubs all around us. And as we walked, one of my friends commented about how quiet it was. Then all of a sudden, my girlfriend, being up front, stopped in mid-step, not saying a thing, just stopped like she was solid frozen. As we all bumped into each other, like the Three Stooges, since we were all walking so close together, I'm sure we looked like, yeah, the Three Stooges. We didn't see anything, but Denise just stopped scared and refused to walk any further. We laughed and said we'd have been watching some scary movies. Then all of a sudden, we all heard someone walking on the side of us off trail next to us. As we stood there, a very large figure, 30 to 40 feet in front of us, stepped onto the trail, looked down the trail at us, raised its arms. We were all athletes, so moving and moving fast was easy. I grabbed my girlfriend and off we ran, tears streaming down my girlfriend's face, saying, I told you, I seen him, I told you. That was the last night for years when we went up there for any reason, especially looking for something scary, witchy, UFO-ish. We found more than we ever thought we would. To this day, I don't know what we've seen, but it didn't want us up there, and we never talked about it afterwards. We still all talk well, five or six of us do, and we don't talk about that. Same location, second incident. 
Again, same area on a summer evening, my cousin came to visit me. She had never been to SoCal, being from a small town in Iowa. I wanted to take her to the beach, so we went to the beach, and after a long day in the sun, on the way home for about an hour from Huntington, I told her the story of the big thing we saw about two years earlier. She wanted to take the drive up the road and see the area I was talking about. It was my cousin, a good friend, and myself. I said, we will, we will, but we will not be going in as far as we did two years ago. But if she wanted to go for a hike the next day, I'll take her there, but we can drive up to the place we parked the truck. As we drove up, we seen some light flashing <coughs> and going in circles. I turned off my lights and parked. We sat there for about five minutes trying to see what the light was all about. But we couldn't see anything, so we got out of the car and tried to sneak up on the lights. We get real close and see people walking around in a circle with whatever was sending the lights in the sky in the very center of the circle. I looked around and get the sense it's time to leave, so I get the attention of my cousin and friend. We start back to the truck, and all of a sudden, the people stopped walking, and the lights went dim from the thing in the center of the circle, and they start walking our way. Off we run. They followed us for a little while, but once we jumped the truck, we drove away in the trail, and not a word was spoken. We went back the next day around lunch, dinner. There were zero signs of anyone there. It's kind of strange. Again, don't know what it was or why it was there. At the time, witchcraft was very high in SoCal, so that is what we always said it was. But to be honest, I don't know and we'll never know. Again, we don't talk about it because it's one of those stories no one will believe. The second story is pretty weird. First story, I've had so many people tell me about seeing things like that doesn't surprise me. But then again, you know, you don't expect to see something like that in Southern California. But the reality of it is, the mountains around SoCal have had a lot of unusual things happening to them, and very close to a population base. Next video. Dave, I watch all your videos and I see your struggles coping with Ben's loss. My heart goes out to you. Thank you for taking on the issue of mental illness. I've determined that mainstream media doesn't report on the issues because they and the extremists have mental health issues themselves. People who think like they're quite scary. They can't be right-minded to try and destroy this great country and to label right-wing people as evil, terrorists, racists, and so on. All this while attempting to defund the police who stand between them and us. The truth of the matter is, conservatives aren't rioting, they aren't burning down business, killing people, or destroying lives. The persecution, not prosecution, of Kyle Rittenhouse and the inflammatory remarks made by mainstream media and our foul president turned my stomach. The good video of the incident clearly showed Kyle defending himself in a lawful matter, and that trial should have never happened. Hang in there, Dave. You have a great many people who care. Retired law enforcement. And you know, I never said much about the Rittenhouse case. Kyle put himself in a bad position. I would never have allowed any of my kids to do something like that. But once he's in that position, the reason that jury came back not guilty is because Kyle Rittenhouse was attacked. He didn't go after anybody. He def tried to defend himself, and those are the facts. And that's why he was found not guilty. <coughs> Next email. Dave, just in case you missed it, I am, oh, this is, this is amazing. I'm sending you the corrected translation. I find this case to be super intriguing, given that it's old. No need to mention the translation. I'm just trying to cheer you up. But mysterious spook involving a child from Switzerland, as told by Colonel von Pfeffer, Lucerne, Switzerland. This is a story that came out of an embassy in Switzerland. And it's a fascinating one. Here we go. In Canton of Uri, in Selenin near Stug, lives a poor yet honest family whose members are a grandfather, son, and his son's wife, Ursula, and their two boys. On August 26th, I'm telling you, August 26th comes up a lot. August 26th, Ben's birthday. On August 26th, 1837, a wondrous and incomprehensible event happened to this family. The older, older child disappeared for three days, despite the parents and many people scouring the, the hills for the small boy. The boy reappeared in that same area three days later, telling various wondrous things about what had happened to him in between. 
I will now share verbatim what I have heard from the parents and the child. On said day, the grandfather, the mother, and the two children were on the so-called Brustenberg Mountain near Stug on an alp named Ruppelben. The father, however, was on another neighboring alp for business. As it was Sunday, the mother went to the church at Stug while the grandfather and both children stayed alone on the lodge on the alp, on which many other people lived, including relatives of my family. He was carrying the youngest child in his arms. The younger, the older boy and some older children had entered the small forest about 60 yards from the house for collecting strawberries in a wooden vessel. Since the child in the forest could have easily fallen onto the surrounding rocks and shrubbery, the grandfather, with the baby who cried perpetually still in his arms, paid close attention to the former. He called him back while he was going to warm up some milk in order to nurse the baby. He then called for the child more seriously, who replied that he would come back now. The grandfather went inside and fed the milk to the baby. So just so you got the story, the grandfather calls for the kid. The kid says he's coming in, so the grandfather turns around and goes in the house. The grandfather went inside, fed the milk to the baby. Meanwhile, the family's sister-in-law, returning from an uphill region where she had collected some snow, heard the other, older child in the forest screaming very loudly. She immediately sent her son to look for the child. She then ran inside to tell the grandfather, who was still busy nursing the baby, uh, the boy screaming in the woods. With the baby in his arm, with the baby on his arm, the grandpa instantly ran towards the area where the boy had been seen, but he did not see or hear anything. All he found was a little wooden vessel where the strawberries were supposed to be in. About ten people were summoned, who then searched the small forest, which was less than a quarter hour in length. That they did not find the child, nor did the older boy who was sent previously find anything. At this point, the mother from returned from church. The grandfather fever fully told her about what had happened. She couldn't believe it, but immediately ran to look for her child. However, both her loud screaming, crying, and wailing, and the search that was going on inside the small area, which getting lost in such a short time shouldn't have been possible, were in vain. The mother, a beautiful woman, and some others even kept searching the area all through the night, yet the child was and remained gone. Nobody saw or heard anything of him. They believed he had fallen into a creek that was running not far away, or that a spirit had taken him. The letter had allegedly occurred repeatedly in the high mountain areas. The next day they sent for the father, who couldn't do anything about it other than helping with the search, which he did, with tears in his eyes. They were supported by many people from the area. On Tuesday, 12 people were searching, and on Wednesday there were seven, as they couldn't find a single trace neither within the forest nor in the creek passing near Stuk. It was decided that the knell should be sounded. Legend had it, however, that there was still hope for the child to reappear if he was taken by a spirit. That, that sentence said, it was decided that the knell, K-N-E-L-L, -L, should be sounded, whatever that meant. On Wednesday at 5 p.m., when the knell was indeed sounded in Stug, two boys aged 13 and 10 happened to be above the point where the child was lost. As they were looking down, they noticed something moving on the ground. It was the lost child, playing with small stones and building houses out of them. At that very moment, the child tried to stand up but sank back down immediately as if too weak. The younger boy went towards the child, which became so frightened that he trembled in every limb. The place where he was found is at the side of the small forest. At a creek, it has a tiny side stream where the child could have crossed without getting his shoes wet. The child was found on a rock. Let me read that again. At a tiny creek with a tiny side stream, which the child could have crossed without getting wet. The child was found on a rock next to this creek. His dress was unbuttoned, a large piece of which was torn out from the bottom up on its front side. He had lost his cap and shoes. The bottom parts of the socks were completely ripped, up, ripped off so that he was walking on bare feet. The feet, however, were in perfect condition. Besides his immense feebleness, the child was quite alert and had full red cheeks, complaining about only being weak and pain below the chest. The boy that had crossed down to the creek took him to his rescuer's family house. They fed the child and called for to the father, to whom he blew a kiss. The child did not immediately recognize his mother, however. He only did blowing her a kiss, too, after she took him in her arms and asked, Johann Joseph, don't you know me anymore? Responding to the questions about where he had been and what he had done, he said, quoting, a big black man came and seized him by his neck, period. He carried the boy very quickly sideways through the forest and took him to the place where he was later found. 
Due to the rapid pace, the child lost his cap and shoes in the bushes and had his dress torn. When the fear made him scream, loud, scream loudly, the black man told him not to scream, saying he didn't mean him any harm. The child also explained that he saw his mother screaming and crying right next to him. He wanted to scream, but was prevented from doing so by the man. One of the searchers who, who the child apparently knew even stepped over the place where the boy was sitting while carrying a stick. This was indeed confirmed later. How could you do that and not see the boy? Come on. The child went on to say that he was in heaven, where he saw a beautiful white bridge and houses. <clears throat> People were playing music and dancing, and he participated in those activities. In addition, he also saw two white horses. When asked whether he had slept, he replied, yes, he did, laying on one side with his head resting on his outstretched arms. He wasn't aware of the rain that fell during those two nights. When further questioned on various things, he wouldn't respond anymore. As an interesting note, the child said that he had almost come into contact with that tiny creek, with his head being very close to it. He hadn't eaten anything. He didn't want to go back to the black man, but rather wanted to ask the guardian angel to ask him back to heaven because it was more beautiful there. Otherwise, the child is well and vivacious and has never been sick. He started speaking very early and, as usual, was more playful among children. He didn't want me to write down what I was told and tried to disrupt me by screaming. For his age, the child is healthy and strong with candid facial characteristics, dark eyes and blonde hair resembling his father. He does not like to spend time with other children, but rather with the parents, preferably with the mother when at home. The child also enjoys praying and does so each morning and evening on his own accord, particularly to the guardian angels so he would be brought back to heaven. He repeatedly asks his parents to attend church. This is a new paragraph. This is a sealed testimony issued by the priest in Stug confirming the truthfulness of his story as well as the integrity of the family. Written down November 13th, 1837. Tell me that isn't fascinating. Now, one thing that wasn't quite clear is we can tell that the the young boy was pretty mature. We don't know his exact age. And when he said a black man carried him and the speed through the forest was so fast that he lost his shoes and tore his clothes and things. How fast is that? And then how could others step over him without being seen? Pay close attention to that. Yeah. Well, It's all very concerning, very concerning. Well, let's talk about some stories first. First one has to do with uh, a mortician from Grover City, California. Douglas Grenstead, 39 years old, is a deer hunter. And he and his family ran a mortuary house and he liked to hunt, he liked to go out alone. September 28th, 1968, he told his family that he was gonna go on a hunting trip in the Sierras near Ebbets Pass, south of Lake Tahoe. And that's a big area, <laughs> a very big area. Well, he told them that he'd be back on October 3rd and he didn't come back, and the family called the sheriff, reported, as, reported him as missing, and his 1966 blue and white station wagon is also missing. The problem was is that they weren't quite sure where to tell the sheriff he was gone. That's important. As I've told you in past videos, specifically one I, I told you recently about it, a Hawaiian disappearance where a man gave somebody a map and said I will be right here if I'm not missing or if I'm missing and you send somebody to search for me that's the best thing you do give someone a map of where you're going to be in this case Grinstead's family had no idea where he was going really didn't just a part of the Sierras so on October 3rd they report him as missing and they put out a statewide California all points bulletin for that car and so I can tell you that those come out a dime a dozen. 
there's no way you remember them all. Only if you saw a suspicious vehicle and ran the license plate would it come back. In this instance, law enforcement didn't find the car. Two boys riding motorbikes found the car. Nowhere near where it was supposed to be. So in South Lake Tahoe, just south of there, there's a town called Myers. And Myers is a little town right at the base where the mountains start to go straight up uh, towards Echo Summit. And it's a route that Highway 50 takes from South Lake Tahoe to Sacramento. Been there a thousand times. <clears throat> well, they find his car on a logging road just south of Myers, off Highway 50. And these boys find it and they tell the sheriff. Sheriff comes out and it's a very muddy old logging road. And from their parents, they think it might have been stuck, but they aren't 100% sure. They run the license plate, comes back as a missing person, Douglas Grenston. So the El Dorado County Sheriff calls for reinforcements, search and rescue, etc. And they bring in about 100 searchers. And they start covering the area around there. And the first day, on the 14th of October, they found what they thought was Douglas's base camp. They find a sleeping bag, they find a machete, they find his deer tags, but they don't find him. Now in that area, there was 18 inches of snow. And one thing that isn't explained at all in anything I ever read is why they weren't able to find tracks from the site where his camp was. Why, why wouldn't you be able to just find those? To eventually wherever he was. But they did search that area. Elevation about 6,500 feet, could go up to 7,000 feet in that area. <clears throat> they threw everything at it that they could, but the track issue is of concern. Now the family and even search and rescue members in El Dorado County, South Lake Tahoe area, made comments in the news about how they thought the sheriff didn't commit the number of resources to it that he should have to find Douglas. You don't see those and hear those kind of complaints from search and rescue professionals very often. It was uh, very odd, very odd to hear that. But he was never found. Now that was 68, that's decades and decades ago. And in the archives, it never talks about him being found. It's guaranteed that that rifle will be out there forever. And his boots, belt, jewelry. Sad story. And uh, the family did go back other years in search, and they put up to a $1,000 reward. Never initiated anything else of, of a find or any leads in the case. Very sad. <clears throat> now, for the people that have never been to that area, let me help you out. So, this is Myers right here. And then if anybody knows, this is South Lake Tahoe Airport. And then Lake Tahoe would be right here in the city of South Lake Tahoe. I went to the actual police academy with a man that went to South Lake Tahoe Police. And my folks had a cabin at South Lake Tahoe for many years. So I've been through this area many, many times. I fished the area of Echo Lake dozens of times. So this area is tons of boulders, tons of water. Um, this is the old Sierra Ski Ranch. And uh, this is Highway 50. The area where the car was found was about two miles south of Myers. So, anyhow, I'm glad you got to see that. And I've told you before that I grew up and my dad had a plane. And uh, we used to go to Baja in it, flew around the U.S. And I got to be pretty adept at understanding private planes. I, and I knew from my dad that there were some planes you stayed away from, never get in them, and there were other planes that were really good planes. And 
plane we had was called a Balanca, and uh, it was built like a brick. That's the reason my, my dad trusted it a thousand percent and treated us well. So I, I'm always interested in pilot stories and plane stories. And this one, in fact the next two, deal with Kenai, Alaska. Now the first story is uh, October 16th, 1998. And, I'm sorry, yeah, 1993. I've got like 30 things going on in my head. Kenai, Alaska, a pilot named Daniel Hausberg. And Daniel was a pilot flying for South Central Air and they flew, flew the route between Kenai and Homer on a regular basis. And every morning, they flew what they called the mail run back and forth between the two cities. And it takes about 55 minutes to fly that route back and forth along the coast. It's a beautiful run, beautiful scenery. Weather can be horrible. Well, Daniel's flying a Cessna 206. And... <clears throat> On the morning of the 16th, Pilot Hausberg is asleep in his room and at 3.40 in the morning, Pilot Wesley Ballard calls him up and gives him the weight of his plane, standard, so that he can make sure that he has the right amount of fuel, doesn't overload the plane, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, and he also gets uh, special directions to take a certain plane on this trip. And that would be Nora 5282. And he was told to take that plane and go down and then switch it out for Nora 208 SC. Both are Cessna 206s. So he leaves, gets down there about five o'clock and turns it around, switches planes, and takes off again. And at 6.11, he's going Kenai now to Homer with a return run. Well, at 6.40 in the morning, along that route, people heard a plane flying really low. And they said this, the engine sounded perfect, and then they hear a loud crash. Well, they go out and they find that 1985 Cessna 206 crashed and Daniel dead. The plane was heavily damaged. And the company was, was shook. This is one of their primary pilots, thousands of hours of experience. What happened? That's a really good question, right? So, this is the kind of plane they're flying, Cessna 206. Now, step up a little bit, December 3rd, 1994. Same plane, same kind of plane right here, South Central Air, flying a contracted mail route from Kenai to Homer. Plane involved is Nora 5282, the plane that Daniel switched out and he took the other one. I left Kenai at 4 a.m. The flight should have taken 55 minutes. It's carrying a personal locator beacon. Yeah, that's right. The pilot on this trip was Wesley Ballard, 32 years old. The same pilot that gave Daniel the instructions on the weight. So imagine this. The plane that Daniel switched out is now the plane that Ballard is flying. They're both flying the same route in the same direction. Okay? Ballard disappears. And there's a huge search. In the same general area, where Daniel disappeared. 
Now, the transmitter didn't go off. There was no call for distress. The plane was in good working order. Well, Air Force Base was notified, Alaska State Troopers, National Guard, Civil Air Patrol, Air Force, Coast Guard, huge search. Went on for days. Because not only do you have a man missing, but now you have the whole plane missing. Time about the same of the disappearances. The direction the same. So, this is Kenai, Alaska. Oops, sorry. This is Kenai, Alaska. Kenai to Homer. Now, the thought was that Ballard disappeared somewhere off this point, <coughs> possibly in the water. But everybody knows a plane hits the water, breaks up, gasoline and oil are on the surface, transponder goes off. None of that stuff happened. How can that be? So, Again, you have a plane from the same company. The same two pilots are involved in both crashes or disappearances. They eventually did find Douglas's plane in the area where the people heard the crash and the sounds. But this is one of the most unusual cases because people in instruments or planes were involved in both and both ended up missing, and both ended up not being found. Now, Alaska has very, very tough weather to fly in, and there's a lot of bush pilots that disappear every year. Now, the difference is, is that these, these two people, two pilots, were flying a route that they probably, probably flew dozens, if not hundreds of times. They knew it. Like, you know, your, your route to and from the local grocery store. Now, on Ballard's trip, the last one that was never found, it was lightly snowing, and there was five miles of visibility. It's flown in those conditions all the time. That's the way it is a lot in Alaska. So that wouldn't be unusual. But when things are not found, Big things, like planes. Very strange. In Missing 411 Law, LAW, Land, Air, and Water, <coughs> I wrote, a wrote about a series of disappearances in Alaska that were equally strange, coincidental, and they were never found. One disappearance involved multiple legislators from our government that disappeared in Alaska, never were found. And they pulled out supposedly all of the stops imaginable looking for that plane. Just like this company did here, I, I don't guess for one second that they didn't do everything they could to find Wesley Ballard, especially since his dad was also a pilot from that area. The Grinstead case, Ballard, Hausberg. Sometimes I think it, they've got to be all intertwined somehow. People not being found is one thing. Decades later, not finding the equipment they were with does not make sense. Like I said, the rifle in Grinstead should have been found. That has a serial number, so forever they could retrace it and find back who the owner is. Even now, today, they could. So, <clears throat> those are the stories for this week and the letters. Hope you found it interesting. Really recovered four missing people. Uh, the boy from Switzerland. I think that's a, that's a very, very interesting story for a multitude of reasons. One big biggie is the parallels to the profile points in my stories. And then the boy's feet not being injured. The statement of the boy about who took him. 
and the reality of the boy being put in the back in the same spot and his description of where he went was like heaven. What could that mean? Obviously, in my world, it doesn't make sense that a real black person took him and then took him to a spot that looked like that, like heaven, and then returned him back. And then this boy saw people walking right over him, but they never saw him. How can that be? What type of world would that have been? Or could he have been trapped and put in a portal of somehow? Those are the good questions that we don't know the answers to. Something very different happened there. And uh, without that, that priest making that investigation and taking the time to understand it, we'd never hear about it. Now, right now, we have over 200 videos on our channel. I wish you'd watch them. And uh, it helps me when you do watch them. And uh, tell your friends. Some people are going to say, well, you know, Dave tells stories about personal locator beacons not finding people. That's the rarity, folks. It's very rare. That's why they're just, I'm telling the story. But there's thousands of stories of people who have been found with personal locator beacons. Again, <coughs> again, the number one thing that you should be getting any hiker that you know. Personal locator beacon. If you like the videos, please watch them. Uh, please make comments on them. You will hear more from me in the very near future about where I'm going and what I'm doing. We're actively having interviews with different platforms. Um, this video, although there were, were some letters in it, predominant content is about missing people. And I'm gonna continue to post videos about missing people nonstop. Not for entertainment purposes, but this is for you to learn. And the example today, Mr. Grenstead, if he would have told people where he was going, the possibility that his life could have been saved and he could have been found would have been much, much better. So get out a map, make a copy where you're going, give it to a friend. Let them know the date shall be where. All right. Hey, thank you for being here. I'm honored, honored and humbled that you guys are willing to listen to me. And uh, I know I'm, I know I'm very blessed to have such a nice group of people. Each of you are appreciated, really. And each of you are wanted. And I know I have a lot of people online here that are recovering addicts. You can do this day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour. You can do it. And I know I have <coughs> a group of disabled people out there as well that follow me. And as soon as I can get back outside where I'm 100% and I'm not in danger of killing myself by getting sicker, you'll be seeing uh, shots from the outside again. So be patient with me, but each one of you are important. And I'm not here to demean anybody, and I would never purposely demean anyone. So take care of yourselves, take care of each other. You know, if uh, you need resources or you need help on a specific issue, post a question on this video page and we have a lot of people out there with a lot of knowledge that can help you okay thank you have a great week politis out